Um, hi, yeah, that was a great intro, Nicola. Um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm Deb Raji. I'm now um, based in UC Berkeley. I'm also a, a trustworthy AI fellow at the Mozilla Foundation, but. Uh, my journey into CS and the AI world actually started at U of T. I'm, I'm looking at Shelia because I think I took your AI class. That was my first AI class. So um, it's kind of interesting being back on campus. It's been a while. Um, and yeah, I'm super, um, super happy to engage with this community and learn from this community um, uh, as they sort of think about these sort of trustworthy AI elements of uh, these products as they make their way into the market. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm here to talk about audits. Um, I actually uh, worked with Ryan on, on that project that he just presented. Um, the team that I lead at Mozilla is called the Open Source Audit Tooling Project. And so we had a couple papers looking at sort of the opera operationalization of audits um, because it's sort of one of those things that's easier said than done. And as it was making its way into policy, um, people were realizing that they didn't know how to do audits or how to operationalize them. And so a lot of that work um, came out of just us investigating sort of the pragmatic side of things. And so this talk is going to be oriented towards that because the goal of audits is to get us to accountable outcomes. Um, they're not just evaluations. They're not just, you know, um, valid, meant to be valid measurements of the distance between, you know, what we're building and what we hope we're building or what our expectations are for the system. But there is meant to be this connection to actual consequential um, judgments in terms of, you know, what happens to the company on the other side. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that struggle um, of, of getting audits to matter um, and um, focus on the policy side of things, because I think, you know, Ryan's done a good job on the overview of uh, some of the more uh, CS related literature. Um, so to sort of motivate the problem, I feel like anyone that's like an engineering undergrad uh, in the room <laughs> probably recognizes this maybe, but um, this is the Quebec Bridge. And um, in August 1907, the Quebec Bridge collapsed. Um, and, you know, any sort of, you, you know, Canadian engineering alumni that's like wearing an iron ring probably remembers the story of Theodore Cooper, um, who was a lead engineer on the Quebec Bridge and um, sort of pointed by the government to be a, a, a key factor in the collapse of the bridge. And this is one of those canonical examples. You know, he didn't heed warnings from his staff. He didn't uh, execute the adequate safety measurements and safety protocols. And so it was one of the first examples of sort of an engineering failure being really attributed to the lead engineer of the project. Um, and a canonical example of this notion of engineering responsibility, which is that, you know, of course, things go wrong when you, you know, release a product or you build an engineered artifact. But sometimes, you know, that's the responsibility of those that are building the tools. There's actual accountability that's required for those that are making design choices that lead to the actual product itself. And so um, a lot of what I'm gonna be arguing today is how audits factor into this notion of determining who should be accountable in terms of those building the technology and how that relates to um, broader accountability measures in the field. So yeah, the first argument I'm gonna talk about is pretty much you know the, the Theodore Cooper argument of engineering responsibility applies to AI products. AI products are not exempt from that notion of those that build this system have responsibilities and should be held accountable. Uh, so I'm gonna start there. And then I'm gonna go into sort of some of the methodological details of how people are currently doing this, what the current ecosystem looks like. I won't spend too much time there because Ryan did a good job um, providing that overview. Um, and then I'm gonna end with sort of these legal questions. Um, how do we legally empower audits and then sort of what is the current ecosystem? What's happening right now? So yeah, let's start with this first conversation of the fact that um, you know, when we talk about bridges or toasters or cars, um, we're not necessarily talking about something different when we talk about AI products. So you know, that was August. 1907, when the Quebec Bridge collapsed in September 2023, um, I was sort of invited to attend uh, the inaugural session of uh, Senate leader Chuck Schumer uh, in the US, um, in U the US Congress. He sort of ha had this insight forum organized around AI technology and accountability for AI systems. Um, and so this is me, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, presenting at the forum. Uh, this is sort of me on a panel of experts. And so in the audience of that forum were about 
60 senators, um, which is quite big, and it's a bipartisan population of senators, which is very rare in the US, um, and their staffers. And they were there to sort of ask questions and investigate um, accountability for AI systems. And sort of here's the list of the other attendees <laughs> at the forum. Um, and this is this is me here. Um, and so, you know, when this first got announced, my friend brought up the fact that I was the only like non-CEO, non-executive director, and I was like, thank you for noticing that. Um, uh, but yeah, it was definitely, you know, very sparse in terms of academic perspective, um, very sparse in terms of, uh, you know, non-corporate perspectives in the room. And because this was a closed meeting, I think a lot of the feedback that I get is along the lines of, what were you talking about? What was said in this room? What did people say? So there were two messages. So one, one thing to clarify is that they didn't necessarily reveal any secrets that hadn't been uh, discussed in the public previously. Um, and it kind of split into the two narratives that you see in the in the media. So one narrative was that AI is sort of supernaturally great. Um, and I, it wouldn't be surprising to hear that this was a lot of the CEOs and a lot of the a lot of those with sort of a financial stake in the industry obviously had sort of this marketing incentive to paint AI as this kind of miracle technology. Um, so, you know, Bill Gates talking about AI transforming education, um, you know, Sam Altman discussing a productivity boom, et cetera. Also, am I echoing a lot or is that like, are you guys able to hear me properly? Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> Maybe it's just on stage. Um, and, and this language of AI being supernaturally great is also something that I encounter in policy conversations. So, you know, here's a quote from an EU, um, a member of parliament where they say, you know, AI is the control center of the new data layer that surrounds us, which can be thought of as the fifth element after air earth, water, and fire. <laughs> um, and that was actually in the EU AI draft until, you know, a lot of people lobbied to remove it. But people have really optimistic views about AI systems. Uh, another quote from Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, says, you know, AI might capture the light cone of all possible future value in the universe, right? So people are just super optimistic about this technology. And then at the same time, there's sort of this narrative of AI being sort of supernaturally dangerous. And that was also very present in the room. Um, and so this is, you know, Elon Musk is, uh, you know, super vocal about this. Um, uh, Eric Schmidt, um, who's a former CEO of Google, but now he runs uh, Schmidt Futures. He's been very vocal about AI being sort of this threat to humanity or threat to civilization. And Sam Altman, who is sort of strangely on both sides of this coin, um, um, has also been um, sort of talking about this risk of extinction. Um, and, you know, you might have noticed this in the news as well of people sort of saying AI is a bigger threat than climate change, that, um, you know, it's a global priority on the scale of pandemics and nuclear war. And so that was also sort of this other narrative was AI being supernaturally dangerous. Um, but at the basis of both of these views of AI being supernaturally great or supernaturally dangerous was kind of a fundamental assumption about the technology's functionality. They were both looking at an ideal form of the technology that was operating as expected or beyond expectations, rather than considering the reality of a set of maybe more fragile and broken systems. Um, and so, you know, they all kind of rested on this assumption that AI works. And, um, you know, I had to sort of be the person in the room to say, well, does it? You know, because a lot of my experience and a lot of my interactions in this space have been dealing with AI failures, the fact that often these systems are constructed imperfectly or designed imperfectly, and they tend to fail in practice. So here's just a couple headlines of these systems, you know, um, having failure rates that are completely unacceptable um, uh, in various settings and as a result causing a lot of harm. Um, and so this notion of, you know, even the critics of the technology buying into, you know, myths of the technology's performance has actually been coined in STS literature um, by Lee Vinzel, who's an STS scholar, and he kind of uh, discusses this under the notion of crit hype, where uh, the critic itself, the critic themselves, kind of fall into these hype cycles and just believe the version of the technology that's pre presented to them by those that are, more, you know, optimistic about the technology, and as a result, they end up kind of locked into these wishful worries, where they're worried about 
a version of the technology that doesn't even exist, and as a result, ignore quote unquote actual agonies or the complexity of a reality where you're dealing with technologies that are failing in unpredictable ways. Um, so an example of that is, uh, you know, Cambridge Analytica obviously was, you know, a very big story. People were very worried about the privacy implications of the way that Cambridge Analytica, you know, was able to source a bunch of data of Facebook users. Um, but um, in the testimonies for the court cases related to that, you actually see that the technology itself was not very predictive of a lot of the, you know, voting patterns or voting behaviors, for example, that they claimed to be. Um, and so the technology itself was also dysfunctional, had basic validity issues beyond, you know, the privacy and other concerns that were raised. And so being cautious of that, you know, making sure that the concerns we're addressing are not just anchored to a version of the technology that works well or too well is, is definitely something um, at the crux of why it's important to look at audits and, and a product safety lens. So uh, me and some co-authors actually named this the functionality assumption because it was showing up a lot in policy. So an example is, you know, the New York City bias audits for um, AI related employment tech um, is very anchored to a version of the technology that functions and it works well. And so a lot of the bias audit requirements are very focused on, you know, the four fifths rule and other sort of uh, you know, regulatory requirements around fairness, but there's very little in terms of requirements to just assess the basic validity of the claims being made by these technologies. These are tools where they try to predict hireability based off of things like face data or um, personality test results. Um, and nothing in the law addresses those basic validity claims. And so, um, you know, this is one example of the way this sort of functionality assumption plays out in the policy space. Um, and so, you know, my co-author, uh, Lizzie Kumar, found this um, meme, and she says this embodies our paper, which is that people are yelling and are so upset about this technology sort of taking over the world for good or for bad. Um, and we're like, I don't, we're not sure if it can differentiate between like a cat and a dog. <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't work that well on a basic level in many cases that matter. Um, and so a lot of the work that I've been doing has been sort of revealing that or exposing that in many ways of just, you know, some of these basic functionality failures or premature deployments. So um, I'll just start by just briefly talking about like, what do I mean by failure, um, especially in sort of like a legal compatibility level or like a accountability level. So, you know, one thing is that in this paper, we taxonomize failure. So we talk about, you know, sometimes you have, you design tasks where it's like inherently incomprehensive. So you're trying to predict someone's, you know, uh, you know, sexual preference based off of their face data. You know, that's just sort of like an inherently incoherent task and like an impossible task. Uh, sometimes you have sort of engineering failures. So you have, uh, you know, decisions that were made with respect to choices on the engineered system that leads to drastic negative consequences. So in the social services, for example, a lot of the like risk assessment, AI risk assessments that are deployed in that context are just operationally dysfunct. They're not well built or carefully built. And as a result, when they fail, they, they cause harm. Um, and then finally, there's sort of post-deployment failures. So the way in which people use the technology being very different from the way it's been advertised to be used. So in the facial recognition context, you know, maybe the systems are assessed on nice, uh, well-lit uh, uh, images, but then uh, the way that the uh, police officers are using it is actually, uh, you know, using mug shots or grainy footage or even sketch images of, of individuals to predict um, uh, suspects. So that kind of uh, post-deployment or user human failure. And then finally, uh, there's a bunch of these communication failures. So uh, we have already seen several cases of just blatant false advertising in the AI space. And so one of, one of the reasons why it's important to sort of taxonomize these failures or another lens through which to understand why it's useful to talk about, you know, auditing and evaluating for failures like this is because, you know, we have actually had these sort of snake oil reckonings in other related industries. So um, in the sort of food safety space, in the medical sort of pharmaceutical space, and even you know for other engineered artifacts like in the vehicle space, again, I apologize, this is all very US centric examples in these books um, uh, because I, I mostly do my policy work in that context. I'm sure there's sort of analogies of this in the Canadian context or EU, but um, in the US they sort of had several 
uh, waves of consumer protection movements because of the way in which people were just so keen to throw whatever they could on the market. And so in the early sort of pharmaceutical days, people would literally sell snake oil as a remedy for all kinds of diseases, even though, you know, that was almost poison for certain patients. Um, in the food safety space, people would put whatever they could to make their food look as good as they, it, they could, despite the health repercussions. And then in the sort of vehicle space, Ralph Nader in the book, Unsafe at Any Speed, goes into detail about how um, automobile manufacturers regularly would you know, um, under test their brakes or their steering mechanisms because to get a product out into the market faster or to get it to look better, um, meanwhile endangering consumers in the process. So we've had this happen in um, other industries, at least in the US so far. And so as a result, we already have sort of an ecosystem of uh, consumer protection laws in the US that we can leverage when talking about AI systems and how to think about functionality or performance for AI systems. So one way I like to kind of explain this is that when AI systems do something wrong uh, or get into some kind of scandal, there's sort of like two responses. So one response is that of treating the AI system as like a toddler. Um, so this happened with um, GPT-3, um, which is the sort of precursor to GPT-4. Um, when that got released, um, it was trained mostly on Reddit data at the time. And so when it was released, you know, it had a really, it had a horrible potty mouth. Like it was just incredibly horrible and had a bunch of horrible stereotypes embedded into it. And when people confronted OpenAI about it, their response was sort of like, you know, the same way that someone would react if their toddler started swearing, suddenly they were like, I have no responsibilities. I have no control. Like, I don't know where they learned that word, you know? <laughs> like that was sort of the reaction of uh, the company in response to critiques of what, you know, GPT-3 at the time was spewing. Um, and I think that that is a common reaction because these systems are not deterministic in the way that other software programs are deterministic. It's really easy for software engineers or machine learning engineers to take their hands off of um, the wheels or to claim that their hands are off of the wheels when it comes to determining the output of AI systems. However, in reality, uh, these systems are much more like a toaster, right? You know, whether or not there's sort of this deterministic link between the choices we make as engineers and the outputs of these systems, uh, there is this direct relationship between what people choose to do, how, you know, the kinds of data that they select, the models that they uh, deal with, the way that the systems are deployed and where they're deployed, and the outputs of these systems. And so, you know, when Regulation, when regulators come together to discuss these systems, um, you know, they think about things in the way that you would think about, you know, what does it mean for a toaster to work? Um, so what that means is sort of thinking about market compliance and consumer protection, you know, before you can sell your toaster, there's specific requirements. Um, uh, thinking about procurement. So, you know, if the government was to make purchase of that toaster or a retailer was to make purchase, you know, what are the requirements that you would have to comply in order to sell it to big enough clients? Uh, false advertising laws, so, you know, faithfully representing what your toaster can do. Product liability and tort, so if your toaster causes harm, an avenue for people to be able to uh, collect the evidence that they need to push back on that. And then warranties, which is sort of like a guarantee in terms of, you know, the performance and validity of the performance of the toaster over time. Um, and so, you know, a lot of different regulatory regimes that are emerging are beginning to realize that AI products are not that different from a toaster. And so, you know, what does it mean for an AI system to work? It probably means a lot of the same things. <laughs> um, uh, probably means a lot of the same laws apply that existed because of all of the past advocacy on consumer protection. We already have an ecosystem of laws that might just be able to be translated or ap applicable to the AI space and to AI products. Um, and of course, there's things about AI systems that are very different, right? These are data defined systems. So privacy is a huge factor. Representation of the data and demographic representation is a huge deal. So anti-discrimination, you know, impact on democracy. There's all these factors about the AI context that does not apply to a toaster, of course. Um, but at a basic level, if we expect these products to be sold on the market, then we should start thinking about it through the lens of, at, at minimum, the expectations we have for a toaster should apply for these AI products. Um, and we're seeing that a little bit already. So, you know, the FTC in the U.S. has taken quite a few actions um, through this lens of sort of uh, product safety and consumer protection. And, and they're sort of the consumer protection enforcer in the U.S. And so they have, um, you know, for example, uh, published quite a bit on like false advertising um, for AI products and sort of uh, clamping down on that. 
Um, and then the FDA, which is another really big regulator in the U.S. Um, for food and drug safety, um, they have started trying to think about adapting existing product safety regulation and thinking about what that means um, in the AI ML context. Um, and so, but one of the sort of interesting things is that in, in the existing consumer protection regime, at least in the U.S., um, something that keeps coming up is this idea of sort of indep independent evaluations and audits. And so I'm going to talk next about sort of what that means in a practical sense in, in, this, in this sort of world of AI products. So, you know, I'll start by just sort of explaining at a high level what an audit is. So, you know, all technology sort of makes explicit and implicit claims, um, you know, to performance or otherwise or safety. Um, so, you know, when you go on Facebook and you scroll through and you see an advertisement, there's sort of this implicit claim being made about, you know, that, advertise that advertisement being sort of representative of your user profile or best suited for your user profile. Um, you know, if you go on Amazon and you search up diapers, you assume that the you know top result is sort of the best product for your search. And you know, this is a bit of a dated example, but there used to be a lot of these um, you know apps to sort of uh, detect skin disease or or melanoma detection. And so it would be like you take a picture of your skin and it it gives you feedback in terms of the health of your skin. So a lot of those dermatology apps, you know, uh, were really popular and like like. 2017 around then, 2015 to 2018. And then of course, facial recognition technology, which is pretty prevalent in a lot of applications in immigration and law enforcement. So both of those technologies sort of have an implicit claim about sort of performing well for all skin tones. They they sometimes say it explicitly, sometimes they, they just imply that it's not gonna be variable in terms of their performance on all skin tones. And so what algorithm auditors or AI auditors do is sort of vet and challenge these claims. Sometimes those claims are legally binding. And so it's, it ends up becoming a legal challenge um, in these deployed AI products. And again, I'll emphasize the deployed AI products. So we're talking about things that are kind of already on the market or about to enter the market um, as, as, as actual sort of commercial products. So you know you think that this is the best ad for your user profile, but the auditors are saying that you know this is the best ad that the advertisers want you to see. And if it's a job and housing ad and the advertisers want to discriminate based off of a protected attribute, that's actually illegal. And so this is what Piotr um, uh, and some of the colleagues at Northeastern sort of found in their audit of Facebook's ad recommendation system, where as an advertiser on Facebook, you could actually uh, manipulate who you showed your ads to based off of a set of proxy preferences. Um, but also, even if you didn't put any preferences at all, Facebook had a natural bias to showing ads to specific demographic groups. So in this case, this is their result for a set of job ads. In green, it's sort of the generic result. So you can see that a lot of the generic jobs are disproportionately shown to younger the younger population. Um, the AI-related jobs are sort of disproportionately shown to younger men. Um, and then let's say another job for like a supermarket, which was the other ad that they ran, was sort of disproportionately shown to sort of middle-aged women. So there's clearly a gender and age bias in terms of who gets to see these ads. Um, and you know, a lot of these kinds of studies, audit studies were done, and as a result, um, the Department of Urban Housing and Development uh, put out an official complaint against Facebook in 2018, where they effectively, these are a lot of words, I apologize for putting all of that on the screen, um, but effectively what they say is that because there are these algorithmic um, biases in terms of who gets to see these ads, um, uh, the, you know, the platform is effectively inviting advertisers to be able to express unlawful preferences in terms of who they showed their ads to. Um, and that got tossed from the HUD into the uh, Department of Justice, um, and that escalated into a settlement that happened uh, just a couple summers ago, uh, June 2022. Um, and as part of the settlement, um, you know, they had to pay $115,000, which is, you know, an intern salary these days at Facebook. It's not a lot of money, but that's under law in the U.S. That's the maximum civil penalty that they could put down. Um, but I think more importantly, they had to pull these ads. Um, they had to pull out this platform and completely rejig it in order to be able to use it um, But and, and, and um, sort of select an independent third-party reviewer or auditor to sort of investigate and verify the system on an ongoing basis. 
And so that's sort of an example of an audit and sort of some of the consequences that happen in that context. And interestingly enough, some of the academic work that fed into that was actually cited in some of these um, judgments. Another example is uh, that of Amazon. So, you know, when I go on Amazon and I look for diapers, I assume that I see the top result um, for, you know, the, the best suited diaper, the best rated diaper. Um, and what the auditors did was sort of push back on that claim and say, well, this is actually the best Amazon sponsored product for your search. And this was a series of audits that was done by the investigative journalism group called The Markup. Um, and what they did was that they sort of looked at the probability of seeing an Amazon-sponsored Amazon sponsored product and compared it to the probability of seeing, you know, a higher rated product or a, a, a sort of um, a more rated, uh, sort of more frequently rated product and compared that to sort of random chance. And so they sort of treated these as like alternative models of if, it, if this was ranked according to um, whether or not it was sponsored by Amazon versus if it was ranked according to how many stars it received or, um, you know, how many ratings it received. And they found that the most predictive um, attribute of whether or not they saw the product in sort of the top 50 results was whether or not it was an Amazon sponsored product. Um, they also did a similar thing with Google as well, where they literally scraped the results of a Google search and they tried to, um, you know, manually tag sort of which what's the probability of seeing products um, that were Google products, Google sponsored products, or just generic products. So if I look up, you know, best email server, Gmail is sort of the top result, um, even though I'm not necessarily looking for Gmail. And so that's sort of um, a big antitrust issue, you know, um, to sort of prioritize your products over other products on a supposedly neutral platform. Um, and a lot of those audits were heavily cited in a series of antitrust hearings that happened um, in, in US Congress. And then the sort of final example I'll give is this issue or the situation of, uh, you know, the implicit claim when people release these skin-based um, uh, AI apps, and they and they they don't necessarily say it explicitly, but there's an implicit understanding that this is a system that works well for all uh, skin tones. Uh, you know, the auditors, and I was part of this group, um, uh, pushed back and said, "Well, actually, this is a product that only really works for lighter skin tones." Um, and so the first was like, you know, Roxana Dijadu is a professor at uh, uh, Stanford Medical School, and she's now done a couple of these studies. Um, this paper is now published, but here was the preprint at the time where she looks into sort of the effectiveness of these models on different skin types and identify the fact that, you know, you would have 10% to 20% model performance degradation for, uh, you know, higher Fitzpatrick skin tones or sort of darker skin tones versus lighter skin tones. Um, and in the sort of skin disease dermatology app environment, um, where people are literally trying to sort of sell these as, as products, uh, the FTC cracked down on this very early under the premise of false advertising. So if you're trying to sell your product and you don't clarify that it might not work, um, if you have a darker skin tone, that's false advertising. And they were actually really quick to pull a lot of those off of the market for that reason. Um, and then years later, when Google tried to sell a similar product, um, uh, they, Google had developed a model for detecting skin disease, and they were trying to sell this as a product and facing some regulatory difficulty. They implemented sort of um, a, a skin tone uh, gradient in order to evaluate across a wider range of skin tones in response to some of that audit work. Uh, and then a lot of my participation in this whole conversation was coming from a collaboration I had with Joy Bulimwini and Timnit Gabru on the gender shades audit. Uh, what we did was we took a bunch of commercially released facial recognition, uh, facial analysis products. Again, these are things that were out there uh, being pitched to you know, immigration officers and law enforcement at the time. Um, and what we did was we evaluated this on a bunch of different demographic groups. And so we found that these models underperformed drastically for sort of the darker female um, uh, subgroup versus uh, the lighter male subgroup. And you know, sort of were below the threshold of acceptable public performance for that darker female subgroup. And in consequence of that work, um, in the summer of 2019, there was sort of this wave of facial recognition policy that came out. So uh, our audit results were sort of taken up by ACLU and um, Fight for the Future, who are two really big advocacy groups in the US. And they campaigned across various states and municipalities to sort of 
ban or pause the use of facial recognition um, in certain high stakes scenarios because it didn't work as well as expected on especially this marginalized vulnerable group. Um, and they were pretty successful at that. Here's like sort of a glimpse at, you know, all the legislation that showed up that summer. I think most interestingly, um, after the publication of this work, a lot of the companies themselves sort of voluntarily recalled the product. So again, you know, by the time we were auditing them, it was being pitched in, in sales to different uh, clients in law enforcement and immigration. And after our audit results sort of revealed that they were underperforming for this darker female subgroup, a lot of the companies um, uh, decided to update their system within seven months and then, um, you know, still facing some difficulty in meeting performance standards for that subgroup, pulled their products completely off of the market. So IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon um, all kind of pulled out their products um, from directly being sold to law enforcement. Um, and so, you know, given all of these examples um, uh, and more, uh, you know, uh, with Ryan Steed and others in our broken bus paper, we sort of pulled together an understanding of what audits kind of meant in the AI space. And so, you know, we wanted to define an audit more concretely. It's sort of this independent assessment of an identified audit target, you know, being an evaluation of articulated expectations with sort of this implicit or explicit objective of accountability. So all the examples that I gave of these product audits are not just um, you know, valid and thorough and well-visualized evaluations, but they have this objective of accountability where what it means for an audit to be successful is for there to be some policy change or for there to be some product change or for the product to have some kind of um, consequential judgment. So, um, you know, I won't get into this for too long, but, you know, I think some of the interesting things about the paper that Ryan just discussed is just discussing the diversity of, at which audits appear. So, you know, I mentioned a bunch of product audits, which is a, the majority of what, you know, academics focus on and a lot of what regulators focus on. Um, but there's also been a lot of these data audits, for example, um, you know, uh, which are just effectively analyses of the training data into some of these models. You know, one interesting example is that there was a data audit um, of the, you know, common, uh, the, the common, the large uh, web text corpus that was done by Alan AI and a bunch of other colleagues there. And they sort of pretty much just traced the, uh, the, the sort of, uh, a uh, web link attached to each of the different uh, uh, examples in the training set. And they just mapped it to different domains um, and talked about the frequency of the tokens across different domains. Um, but that was enough for the New York Times to sort of see that their domain was there and see that they, there were quite a few tokens from the New York Times domain in this data set. They mapped this to the fact that, you know, ChatGPT was trained on this data set. Um, and that was the basis of like the New York Times lawsuit. So this paper is actually cited in the New York Times lawsuit against OpenAI. So some of these audits, even though they're not product audits, are actually pretty impactful. Um, and yeah, I'll refer you to the paper to sort of look at other examples of the way in which these audits can be really, um, really, really impactful um, uh, tools for accountability across just not just the product context, but in other aspects as well, including data audits, you know, ecosystem audits, et cetera. So um, I don't want to spend too much time on this again, just because I think uh, some of this is in our paper. But you know, it's important to reflect also on who conducts these audits and what methods do they use. So you know, one approach to auditing is, um, and this came up in the last Q and A, right, of sort of self audits, which I would sort of call internal audits. So um, if anyone here is like familiar with finance, there's this notion of an internal auditor in finance, where you have sort of three lines of defense. You have the people building the systems, you know, as you're engineering the system, you have responsibilities there. There's sort of a compliance ecosystem for every company, you know, lawyers, quality assurance teams, et cetera. And then you have an internal audit team, which is really meant to be sort of the communicators across the ecosystem of the company and relating the actions of these different actors to sort of high level expectations as defined by the company or as defined by external stakeholders. And you know who are these people right now in the AI audit ecosystem? Um, a lot of them are management consulting companies. So like Deloitte, Accenture, um, McKinsey through their group Quantum Black, they all have these AI accountability teams or responsible AI teams that operate this audit work on behalf of clients. Um, there's also boutique consultancies like Orca, which is led by Kathy O'Neill. Um, and then there's sort of 
these um, responsible innovation teams at the, the major tech companies. Um, some of these have changed a lot. So, you know, Twitter is no longer with us. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, you know, Google, um, Facebook, uh, Salesforce still have really strong sort of ethical AI responsible innovation teams that do this internal audit work. Um, and their main approach, the main approach of the internal auditors, because they have full access into the system and they're sort of defined as those with a contractual relationship with the audit target, they, they can see everything about the system. And so, you know, a lot of the pros of internal auditing is that it's mostly just a documentation exercise. You're just trying to capture the meaningful aspects of the system in a way that can be communicated to other stakeholders within uh, the company or within the target organization. So, you know, I worked with the internal audit team, ethical AI team at Google. And, you know, one of the first things we did was the model card project where you're just capturing the key de details of the model to be able to communicate with other internal stakeholders. And, you know, of course, because when I say documentation, people are like, oh, that's not very exciting. <laughs> um, but, you know, it can get pretty complicated. If you think about all the different decisions you have to make, like internal auditing is a practice that exists in uh, aerospace industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, in the finance industry. And it's actually a pretty complicated process. So in this paper, we talk about how, you know, the internal audit practice in these other industries are super documentation heavy. And it's sort of this end to end process that involves you know, many rounds of documents and interviews and evaluations of all kinds. And so um, this framework is just an example of how complicated it can get, especially at a really large company like Google. Uh, I think another interesting aspect of internal auditing that people underappreciate is, uh, you know, what it means to automatically log or automatically capture some of these things and monitor them on an ongoing basis. So for example, um, you know, after we did the model cards project at Google, there was another team that sort of took that and tried to automate aspects of the model card and had this sort of model card toolkit developed in order to capture different aspects of that engineering decision-making process automatically and in an ongoing basis. And that's the kind of types of challenges that are faced by internal auditors. Um, you know, but unfortunately, uh, there's sort of a downside to internal auditing, which is you're sort of beholden to, uh, you know, the the priorities of the organization itself. And so, you know, I was working with Tim Nickabrew and Meg Mitchell at the time, um, and, you know, both of them uh, were unfortunately let go by Google after sort of attempting to publish about some of the restrictions on ironically large language models. Um, uh, and it kind of revealed to me at the at the time and, and still now I sort of reflect on the limits of internal audit work really being that you, you need the cooperation of the company that you're working with, especially because we don't currently have mandatory audit requirements from like a legal perspective. A lot of what's keeping these compliance teams in check right now is just pure voluntary governance. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the times the internal audit teams are not allowed to publish their work and speak publicly about their work. Uh, and sometimes if they do, regardless, they, they face consequences. So that's one of the limits of internal auditing. Um, and so that's why it's really good to have a sort of robust ecosystem of audits coming from the outside uh, or external auditors. So there's sort of this they have no contractual relationship to the audit target. Their motivations are much more oriented around representing the interests of their constituents. Their expectations are sometimes completely established independently of sort of compliance to, um, you know, internal standards. Um, and so external auditors um, operationally are a much more diverse group. Um, you know, academics, civil society, journalists, just a variety of different accountability actors um, are now sort of operating in this space. And I won't get into the details because I know Ryan did a good job um, laying those out earlier. And so something that's interesting about external audit work, which I've also had the fortune of participating in, is that, um, you know, for a long time, these audits were just not really effective. When you're on the outside of the company um, and you don't have a direct relationship with the company, there's a lot of issues. So one issue is just, you know, your evaluations are gonna be different from their evaluations. There's always gonna be this benchmark bias and validity issue where you're not sure that what you're measuring is actually sort of um, related to, you know, the deployment context, for example. The other issue is the access to target. So because you're on the outside, you have no way of actually um, being able to interact with the system in a direct way. Sometimes you only have consumer level access to the target. Um, so thirdly, there's a lot of uh, issues with public pressure. So, you know, 
uh, now audits are really popular and especially because there's so much regulatory interest, when someone publishes an audit paper, there's a certain amount of attention it gets. But for a really long time, if you publish something, there was no guarantee that anyone was gonna care. <laughs> um, and, and so there was no guarantee of any kind of public pressure or awareness. And a lot of the companies were um, very quick to just ignore the, the audit results. And then the sort of final thing is that, you know, if you uh, were fortunate enough for the company to not completely ignore your results, um, they would come after you. Um, and I've experienced this, and I think everyone that I know that's in this space has experienced this, of just, um, you know, really intense corporate retaliation, especially if you're, um, you know, targeting a product that is really aligned with their, you know, um, corporate agenda, et cetera. And so, um, you know, one of the first papers I wrote in this space um, that I still stand by is a project I did with Joy Blumenweenie following Gender Shades, where we effectively looked at all these different factors and we um, thought about the design of Gender Shades and how it was effective at mitigating some of these issues. So we talked about, you know, with the benchmark bias issue, um, where we're, when we're evaluating for fairness, like how do they think about that in anti-discrimination law when they audit for you know, disparate impact, for example? And this notion of intersectionality or reflecting on representing different communities explicitly uh, came up as like a really big inspiration for us. Another one was sort of this access to target issue. So, you know, what do you, how do you circumvent issue, issues of access? We looked a lot at the HCI literature and sort of different ways that they approached kind of mocking different stakeholders or mimicking uh, different st stakeholders to interact with the system at different levels um, and how that could provide different degrees of access and um, engagement with the product. Um, on the public pressure side, uh, we looked at financial audits where for a long time people in the industry, in the finance industry, ignored the results of financial audits. And so they started, one, you know, publishing the names of all their audit targets and then doing it for multiple targets. So there was sort of this competitive dynamic where if you didn't respond to the audit, your competitor was going to respond and that was going to give them an advantage in the market. And so that completely changed the dynamics of financial audits. And so we decided that publicly naming, naming multiple targets was something we also wanted to do. And then I'm sure you guys will like this one <laughs> to deal with the hostile corporate reaction. Someone was mentioning earlier sort of security audits being a really good example of not being very well received initially, but then really getting their whole industry on board in the end. Um, and I think that's because of the way that um, audit results are communicated in the security and the information security industry. And, and that's something that we're not very good at yet, but we're learning from that community to learn how to, you know, have like coordinated vulnerability disclosure, for example, where we notify the company, give them a response period and then notify the public. So that kind of um, response uh, disclosure kind of uh, 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 like schema is something that we're exploring as well. But all of this was something that we factored in or thought through in the design of gender shades. And so, you know, something that ended up happening with this particular audit was, you know, when we designed our benchmark, we didn't realize it, but compared to the other, these are the other facial recognition benchmarks at the time, and the pilot parliaments benchmark is the one that was used in the gender shade study. You can see that it's much more balanced in terms of representation for male, female, um, subjects and darker and lighter subjects. And that immediately makes it easier for us to detect some of the biases that we ended up doing. So that's sort of the benchmark bias issue is we just explicitly represented the communities that we were worried about. The second thing was because we named multiple targets um, uh, explicitly, you know, when we audited these systems within seven months, um, you know, and, and it, first of all, the press was interested because they actually knew who was being audited. Um, and uh, because other companies saw that like they had competitors that were also audited, um, all of them within seven months re-released their products and dramatically improved their performance for this darker female subgroup. So this is Microsoft after, a year after being audited. You can see they did much better on that darker female subgroup. This is Face++ Plus Plus, a year after we audited them. And then this is IBM uh, a year after we audited them. And so, you know, there was a couple interesting things about this experience. One was that um, before the audit, if you complained about the possibility of these systems not working well for darker skin faces, you would get a reply similar to this, you know, that it's just fundamentally harder to uh, train a model on a darker face and a lighter face or something like that. But the fact that we saw these improvements within seven months was mostly an indication of the fact that it was an engineering failure. They were not evaluating properly for these um, uh, demographics and they were not training adequately on those demographics. And if they paid attention to that problem, they could engineer a solution to it. And so it wasn't some kind of fundamental limitation of the technology, but like an engineering oversight 
issue, which was interesting for us. Um, I think the other interesting thing or the limitation of these external audits uh, were quite a few. So on one hand, uh, you know, we didn't anticipate some of the responses that we got from the companies. Um, you know, some of the companies uh, decided that in response to the the to the the project, you know, they would collect as many diverse faces as possible in order to retrain these models. And so that's something that IBM did, for example, with their diversity in faces data set. Um, uh, unfortunately, there were other aspects of that process that they overlooked. So, you know, they collected as many diverse faces as possible, but, um, you know, those faces were from Flickr and they didn't get consent from uh, the, the individuals, the subjects that they included in the data set. And so that caused a separate issue for them. Um, and so some of the corporate responses were pretty unexpected. Um, and I think, you know, reflecting on that experience, we would have been maybe a little bit more specific about what we expected in terms of corporate responses to our audit. What would we have liked them to do in response to our audit? Another thing is, you know, after doing the gender shades audit, we got the three companies that we audited the year before to improve their performance on this darker female subgroup. But then um, two other companies that were selling almost identical products in the same market to the same clients, but were not audited by us a year before, still had um, disparities between this darker female subgroup and this lighter male subgroup a year later. And so that told us that, you know, audits are very narrow in terms of their impact. It impacted the three companies that we audited, but no one else in the industry, even though they were selling the exact same products to the exact same clients. Um, and so that was something that made us reflect on, again, how we wanted to navigate the impact of these kinds of external audits, where if we don't name someone, how do we make sure that they're still impacted by the result of our audit? Do we have to leverage this into advocacy more, et cetera? Um, but that was also like another interesting result is that the, 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 Part, the sort of scope of impact in um, external audits is quite narrow. You know, um, we don't have a lot of control over who responds and how. And then I think most depressingly, um, another sort of uh, negative consequence of this external audit was uh, one of the companies we audited in the follow-up study, Kairos, as soon as we audited them and we got a bit of press for it, um, Kairos decided to completely remove their free tier, which is what we had used in our audit. And so, you know, no one could do that, which is fine. Like we were, we got, you know, we have like grant money. And so we were like, okay, well, whatever, we'll pay the $99 a month if you want to be like that. Um, but um, what ended up happening was they also had in their terms and conditions an anti-audit clause. And so if you click through you know, if you, you click to pay the $99 and you click through, you have to accept the terms and conditions in order to get access. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of legalese in there about um, not permitting audits. And, and so we're seeing more and more of that. Interestingly, someone mentioned large language models. Um, some of these um, uh, APIs, proprietary APIs for large language models also kind of have similar language in there around terms of use um, for, for external evaluation. And so, yeah, it's just an ongoing issue around access. And as a result, you know, we we're too scared to follow through and, and keep auditing them. But this, this is a huge issue in terms of access. Um, and so this leads to sort of my final point, which is, uh, you know, it's not enough to just think about clever ways to evaluate these systems. We actually also have to legally create an ecosystem um, that can empower the auditor to do their work. So, you know, I mentioned the access issue where we try to access the information we want about the system in order to get, you know, get the information we may, we need to make our judgment about how well the system is working. And we kind of get blocked out in many cases. Um, I think that's the best case scenario is that we're just blocked out, like the door is just closed in our face. There's a worst case scenario, which happened to, um, uh, you know, the folks at the NYU AI Observatory and the Algorithm Watch, which is a civil society group, um, and some folks that were trying to audit Clearview, which is that, you know, they face actual legal action from the companies. So the companies will leverage privacy laws and anti-hacking laws in order to go after these companies, uh, these uh, auditors. Um, and that's happened a couple times now. Um, there's also some of these issues around auditor independence. So, um, you know, there was a question in the earlier session about, Oh, if, if someone's, you know, an internal auditor, for example, you know, are they really going to be subjective or uh, objective about, you know, their evaluation result? Well, or external auditors um, uh, uh, that are sort of operating with a relationship to the audit target can also be questioned, right? And so we've had a couple cases. So one was the audit of HireVue, which is a facial recognition-based hiring AI, AI hiring system, and that was audited by Orca in 
collaboration with HireVue. So they signed a contract with HireVue to do that audit. Um, and uh, following the audit, in order to access the audit result report, um, it was mediated through HireVue. And so you had to go on the HireVue website to see the audit report, which is fine. But then um, one of the clauses, you had to sort of sign an agreement of how you were going to use the information from the report. And one of the clauses was that you could not critique HireVue or critique the audit um, in order to access the audit report. And so obviously, you know, a lot of a lot of people that were curious about that information were clear. It was like clearly access to that information was being mediated by the company in a way that felt inappropriate. Another example of this is um, an audit of uh, another hiring technology called Pymetrics. Um, and that was done by a bunch of researchers at Northeastern. And um, they wrote a whole paper about, you know, this was gonna be a collaborative audit. They had signed contracts to, to work with Pymetrics to do the audit. Um, but Pymetrics as part of that contract completely set the parameters of the audit. So they didn't allow them to audit certain things. They allowed them to only audit a very specific um, uh, uh, scope of, of, of problems. And obviously, you know, uh, that incurs certain problems where like their audit result, you know, clearly neglected certain issues and prioritized others according to what higher view wanted them to focus on. So this is another example of sort of compromised auditor independence. Oops. Um, and then I'll say another sort of more systematic issue in auditing is this idea of target identification, um, where uh, I realize these are wordy quotes, but they're effectively uh, quotes of people that have been negatively impacted by audits and had no idea, uh, by AI, sorry, and had no idea that an AI system or an AI product was part of it. So, you know, a tenant that was being regularly rejected from um, rent controlled housing and not realizing that um, a, a faulty tenant screening algorithm was behind every single rejection that they were receiving or a job candidate being regularly rejected um, for benefits and, and not um, realizing that an AI system was sort of behind that. So the way that people find out that an AI system is involved in their case is very haphazard. It's very rarely intentional or something that they're fully aware of. So target identification is really difficult. And so because of all of these more systematic issues, um, me and some collaborators at Stanford Law, I worked with the Reg Lab at Stanford Law, and we thought about, well, like, how, how does auditing work policy-wise, legally, in other contexts? So if we think about all of these different problems, you know, uh, how is this addressed in other industries? And so we looked at case studies in other domains where audits are really prevalent, and we looked at sort of their legal infrastructure and policy infrastructure and talked a bit about the kind of policy ecosystem we would need for audits to be feasible in the AI space. I won't get too much into it, but I think like, you know, the main takeaways here is that there's very clear standards and rules. Um, you know, there's a lot more risk-based or complaint-initiated audits than we have in the AI space, and you need a technical infrastructure for that. Um, there's also a lot of these sort of audits where the auditee selects and pays for the auditor, which is not something we see a lot in the AI space, but happens regularly in other industries. Um, there's sort of this notion of rotation. So you can't audit the same target multiple times over multiple years, and that's to maintain independence. Um, but that's not actually a super common requirement across industries. Um, a lot of them sort of have access privileges, sort of getting back to the problem of being shut out or, be, or feeling corporate retaliation for access. Um, a lot of audit policy ecosystems have an explicit carve out for access issues. Um, and then what we thought was interesting was sort of most mandates provided recommended actions. So after the audit is done, there is always in these other ecosystems, a channel to go from audit result to you know regulator or to some mechanism for accountability. And that's not something that we see as much in the AI space. So these post audit actions or filings. Um, and so um, let me just sort of conclude by saying like looking ahead, you know, what should we expect um, you know, uh, from this audit ecosystem? Okay. Yeah, it's good. So one one thing is, uh, you know, it's really hard to execute an audit still. It's still very hard to do. Every audit I've participated in takes a strange, um, like a strangely long amount of time. You know, the actual evaluation itself is not so difficult, but, you know, identifying the audit target, all these other details um, uh, take a lot of work. And so, um, this is why we sort of started this team at Mozilla to think about, well, what are the steps involved in actually getting to an audit result that is meaningful? And what are the resources that we need at each of these steps? And so um, 
interestingly enough, there's sort of this ecosystem of mostly open source audit tools where people that are pretty much self-identified AI audit practitioners have built things to help themselves with data collection or with harms discovery or target identification, for example. Um, and they share these tools with each other and they work with each other or not. <laughs> um, we find that most of it is very ad hoc, um, but effectively they, there's all these resources that are people that are, are potentially available to help support the audit process. And so we mapped a little bit of that out, taxonomized it. Ryan led a lot of that work, did an incredible job. Um, and, and so um, this is sort of the next phase of that project. We have a, a preprint out for that, and um, we're also putting together a full report. At Mozilla, we are also funding a bunch of these projects. So, you know, we had two rounds of funding with through the Mozilla Technology Fund of AI audit tooling projects, um, and we hope to fund more. Um, so that's sort of from the operational side of it. From the legal side of it, this is a slide I clearly stole from Ryan, um, but, you know, there's a lot of legislative work that's happening in the AI audit space. Um, but beyond the legislative work. Uh, so uh, the legislative work um, in the US, I'm not sure what the ecosystem is in other spaces, but in the US, you know, uh, legislation is, is one path towards policy action, but it's not a reliable one. We don't have a lot of bipartisan collaboration that like sticks. <laughs> and so uh, we always look for other opportunities to leverage um, uh, impact. And so we can't rely, although there's a lot of bills that are coming out that are related to AI um, and that do mention audits, um, uh, the path to go from a bill towards legislation in the US is many, many years. And so we don't wanna over rely on that, especially given the fact that we have so many products now entering the market. And so instead, you know, we've been really encouraged and uh, by a lot of the executive actions and um, a lot of the civil society groups that are doing this work have been mostly involved on the executive with the executive branch through the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House um, or working with the different agencies. So some of the wins that have happened in the last like six months is that, um, you know, last summer there were there were these voluntary commitments from a lot of major corporations building AI systems, committing to uh, independent evaluation of their systems amongst other things. Um, there was also the executive order on safe AI, you know, safe, secure, and trustworthy development of AI uh, by the Biden administration. And that included a lot of um, elements from the AI Bill of Rights by the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And again, sort of reiterating this need for independent evaluation was in there as well. Um, and then most recently, uh, uh, the sort of OMB, which is sort of our main procurement guidance in the US, the US government is a big client for a lot of these AI companies. And so having really clear guidance around procurement, um, that rule actually just got finalized a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, and, and a huge part of procurement is evaluation and auditing. Another sort of interesting policy development um, are these AI safety institutes that are happening. So there are these sort of advisory research organizations, again, very focused on what does it mean to evaluate and assess these systems across you know, various concerns or even basic performance claims. So, you know, there was this AI safety summit that happened. Uh, when did that happen? Oh, that yeah, that happened in like, you know, a, around the time. So like late of last, late last year. Um, and, uh, and at the AI safety summit, it was a really like international conversation around what are we gonna do to ensure that these systems are built appropriately and deployed appropriately. And at the AI Safety Summit, the UK AI Safety Institute was announced, um, which is really an institute within, you know, the UK that's thinking about these problems. And similarly, sort of that same week, uh, Vice President Harris announced uh, a US AI Safety Institute, oops, a US AI Safety Institute um, that's based at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US. And so they're doing this research on AI evaluation uh, within the US. And interestingly, like last week or earlier this week, Canada also announced an AI Safety Institute um, with $50 million of investment. So we'll see how that goes, but, um, the EU is now having their EU AI Safety Institute. So we're really seeing a lot of this proliferating. Um, I'll mention this very briefly, just because this is where I started on the policy route was I was really involved in the Digital Services Act and the audit clauses in, in the Digital Services Act. So the Digital Services Act has, uh, you know, Article 28 and 31 are really oriented around data access and safe harbors for auditors, external auditors, and then mandatory internal audits. Um, and so that's something that I've been involved in since like 2019. Um, and that actually came into effect uh, last fall. 
So that's exciting. And that's definitely something that's coming up and implementation of that will be very exciting. Um, also the EU AI Act, you know, after over 24 hours of debate, um, finally uh, passed very recently uh, over the summer or I guess early fall. Um, and so we're gonna see that come into effect soon and enforcement of that. They already have an EU AI office that they're putting up and they're hiring for that. Um, so we're gonna see that implementation and that enforcement play out. And um, audits are obviously a huge part of uh, the product safety lens that they're taking with the EU AI Act. Um, and then uh, just sort of things that are ahead. I, I don't have time to sort of detail these things, but internationally, there's a lot of movement on these topics um, and a lot to look forward to. Um, and I just wanted to end sort of back on the note of the Quebec Bridge, which is, I think something, because I heard this story um, when I was graduating, and something that I wasn't told was sort of of the 80 plus people that um, perished with the crash of the bridge, uh, 55 of them were sort of Native American local workers, um, sort of the most vulnerable within that community were those that lost uh, that lost the most, the, the community that sort of lost the most from that, from that accident. Um, and I think this really reflects a lot of the consequences of when these AI systems fail, where um, you know it's not just that they are failing arbitrarily and causing harm arbitrarily, but those that seem to be uh, the most impacted by this are those that are sort of the most misrepresented or underrepresented in the data, or those that are sort of disproportionately subject to these AI deployments in a way that can cause harm. And so, um, you know, it, you know, the real people at the heart of this tend to be, you know. From the disabled community or other marginalized groups, you know, um, minority groups, um, women, older individuals, etc. Um, and so these are actually images of different individuals that have stories in terms of being negatively impacted by AI system failures. And so just a motivation for why this is important as a policy topic, but also um, for, for the research community to take very seriously. Um, thank you. <laughs>